don't want to appear uh, on the recording, you can turn your camera off. Uh, and if you could keep your, your microphone muted, that would be great. Then we don't get any feedback. Um, be an opportunity to ask questions later. Uh, but let's move on to today's presentation. So it's a great uh, pleasure for me to welcome um, my, my colleague, uh, <laughs> occupies the office next door to me uh, when he's here, Dr. Richard Fitzpatrick. Uh, so Richard is um, the RJ Hunter Research Fellow uh, based here in the Institute of Higher Studies uh, this year at Queen's. Uh, and his research focuses on establishing and building a database on Ulster settler population during the 17th century plantation. <laughs> The project is run in partnership with the Royal Irish Academy and with Maynooth University's Arts and Humanities Institute. Uh, Richard holds uh, a BA in History and Anthropology and a PhD in History from Maynooth, uh, where his research focused on the Ryans of Inch, a Catholic landowning family from Tipperary uh, from the 17th century to the 19th century. Uh, he, he held a John and Pat Hume scholarship from, uh, at Maynooth in 2014 to 18 and a Government of Ireland um, research, research scholarship there in 2016 to 18. Uh, and he's also been involved in developing the Clericus uh, database uh, of uh, Irish uh, Catholic clergy uh, at Maynooth before joining the um, Ulster Settlers database project. So Richard's going to talk to us about this, uh, talk to us this afternoon about this new database and what it can tell us about the, uh, the people who, uh, who came to, to settle in Ulster as part of the plantation in the early 17th century. Uh, so the title of his presentation is the Ulster Settlers database a new digital resource for the study of the province and its people. So Richard, over to you. Lovely. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for coming this afternoon. Um, just on the first slide there, I have the URL for the website in case any of you are interested, and I'll probably forget later on, so it's there to start with. Um, and the first image is really just the landing page of the website as it is at the moment, and it'll give you a breakdown of how many entries are in the database, things like that. Um, and this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about my presentation broken down into several parts. The first part is basically my own background in relation to databases and then the background of the project itself, um, the Ulster Settlers project. Then the aims and objectives of this project, what we hope to achieve. Um, then it's getting a bit into database models, so I apologise in advance for that. Um, but it is important to kind of explain the structure behind the data and how it's presented and it will help you then in turn to navigate it. And also, you're all aware that databases digitization is becoming much more prevalent. Um, so we all use databases every day and probably in your own professional career, you will come across using databases or some kind of system. So it's good to be able to see one example and how it operates. Um, after the model then, so how it's structured, the database will look at the sources, um, what is basically being put into it um, and why, uh, what's the value of it. Then moving on to that would be data ingestion. So we have the sources, we have the database. How do you get something that's physical, you could say, into a digital format? So how do you translate it over? And I'll give you an example from one of the data sets I worked on. Um, and then data visualization. So just two other ways of interrogating the data or presenting the data if you're a user. And then hopefully if I have time at the end, just future phases, what we might do in future to basically bring on the database, make it more useful to as many people as possible. Um, so my own time in the digital humanity started in January 2020 uh, when I started working on a new project called the Clericus Digital Humanities Project in Minut. And as Peter said, it's a database on the Irish Catholic clergy, so two very different populations. Um, Clericus is a prosopographical database um, and basically prosopography Whoever you ask, you get a different answer, but basically what I have there is kind of close enough. So mm. it's basically prosopography or less accurate or less accurately collective biography is a historiographical method that identifies and draws relationships between various people within a specific, well-defined historical or social context by collecting and analyzing relevant biographical data. And I should also add there, it's also a response to the problem of not having much evidence for most people in history. So you're left with kind of tidbits, factoids. So what prosopography does is it brings all these disparate bits of information together and you see then what, what you can draw from that. Um, it's been going on since 18th century, 19th century, but it's really with the advent of computing, 1970s, 1980s, that historians and others saw the potential of being able to 
bring all this information together and to basically manipulate or use it. Um, you see there in the bottom, that's just a, an example from a regular prosopography. It's on the clergy again. It's, again, it's just bits of information. But when you digitize it, what it does, it brings it all together. So you could have this individual here, James Cusack. He went on to uh, ordain a lot of people, things like that. So that's missing from here. But once you bring it all together, you get a much better picture of his um, career, I suppose. Then the current project stems from the Hunter Foundation, which was set up in memory of uh, Robert or Bob Hunter. Um, so his daughter, Laura, and several of his colleagues basically came together after his, his death and created a foundation committee to make basically his work more widely available, better known to a wider audience. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Bob um, was very important in relation to the study of the Ulster Plantation, as you will see. Um, and so the Hunter Foundation and the Royal Irish Academy commissioned a database project and it runs for a year, so it's ending soon. Um, the fellowship is hosted here, as Peter said, and technical assistance is provided by Minute. So the project's aims and objectives are pretty straightforward. Um, design and build a database on the Ulster settlers covering the period 1609 to 1641. So very important period in the settlement. Next one then is to identify as many of the earlier early planter population as possible. Um, no, it's not an exercise of just adding in as many names as possible. It's basically about layering information. So you start off with a good base and from there you build and build and build. And again, you see what comes out at the end. And the last one then is <clears throat> more of a hope <laughs> than a name. It's hopefully it will be a database that appeals to a wide potential user base. So academics, and I use academics, not just historians, you'd have sociologists, historical geographers, um, <clears throat> people interested in big data from computer science. So hopefully it will appeal to some within those areas. Then you also have local historians, of course. Um, you know, it's a useful resource for them in their own research, genealogists as well, and then members of the general public. So people, you might just have an interest in the plantation. They may have family who settled as part of the plantation. So again, it's trying to be as useful as possible to as many people as possible, hopefully. So <clears throat> the database model, it's a graph or a network graph database, specifically Neo4j. And a good way to understand these types of databases is that they're based on nodes and relationships um, instead of tables and documents. And if you want to imagine it, the data is stored like you might sketch ideas on a whiteboard or maybe perhaps as a series of interconnected spiders, webs or constellations. Um, and you can see the image down the bottom right. That is a visualization from the database. That's one person's network, basically. So you can see all the points, their nodes. <clears throat> And then what's connecting them are called relationship types. Um, and when I speak of nodes, what I mean in this context really is entities. And within the database are six entities, four main and two minor. Uh, people are the main ones, as you'd expect. It's a biographical, prosopographical database. Um, then you have events. Um, and the best way to, I suppose, conceptualize events is if you think of someone's life, it is a series. It can be broken down into a series of events. OK, uh, then <clears throat> organizations. This can be a bit difficult to comprehend. Sometimes organizations are basically two. There's institutional organizations and geographical organizations, and there's not always a clear distinction between the two. Um, but the examples I give you there in the state is a type of organization, a proportion. So the parsons of land that were granted. Um, baronies, so if you're not too familiar with baronies, they're an old <coughs> medieval uh, unit. So the way it works usually is, let's say you have Ulster, then you have the counties of Ulster, and then you have the baronies that make up those counties, the precincts that make up those counties, parishes, townlands basically. So as a hierarchy, that's where they sit. Um, I will show you an example of an organization in a minute as well, just to give you a better idea. And then the final main entity is our resources. So pretty straightforward. They're like your footnotes. So if you have an entry, you say something in that entry, you 
uh, connect the resource basically. And where possible, when you if you select a resource, if it's available online <clears throat> or in a copyright, there will be a URL directly to the source. So if you see something you're not sure of, you can go check it yourself, okay? Uh, the two minor entities then <clears throat> are temporal, which are just dates. So you can have specific dates. So the 28th of November, 1622, date ranges, 1622, 1625, or circuit dates. And circuit dates are pretty important in this context because based on the evidence, you can't always say when exactly something happened. So it's going to in the round is the circle. So it's, that's, that's a useful way of dating things. Um, the final one <clears throat> then are spatials. So that's basically any location on a map. So people do get mixed up slightly between organizations and spatials. So an organization, as I said, it's this entity. And then a spatial is, if you wanted to say, where is that entity? That's what the spatial means. It's pointing to it on a map. Okay. Um, so yeah, six entities. And then what connects them, as you can see here, are called relation types or relationship types. Um, and what they do is they describe or define the relationship between entities. Um, and then these relation types and others, such as event types, organization types, form part of the database's taxonomy. So the taxonomy is basically the language that connects everything, underpins everything within the database, helps it make sense of it. Um, <clears throat> and the way this works is, Using relations to connect entities, you create basically a simple sentence structure. So you have subject, predicate, object. And the example I have there is John Doe was native of Scotland. And you also have the inverse then. So if you're looking from Scotland as a kingdom to perspective, you would have Scotland had native John Doe. And more, that's linking, say, a person entity to an organization entity, in this case, Scotland as a kingdom. You can also then have linking a person to an event. So you might say John Doe participated in marriage, and then you can also add his role within that event. So you can say John Doe participated in marriage as groom. Um, and then you'd have the inverse relationship then. <clears throat> so that's basically the relationship types. And then this is kind of an overview then. You see how they're all connected. And you notice that you can connect people to people. Um, so you could say John Doe had son Tom Doe. Uh, Tom Doe was son of. Um, you also then see with events, the minor ones can only, but temporals can only be connected to events, and spatials can only be connected to events and organizations. So that's basically the structure within which all this data is stored and presented. Um, and then this is an example of an organization from the database. So the label on it is orator. And I apologize about more of the pronunciation of some of these places. Um, and the type is it's a tenement. And you can see then you have all the alternate names that it appears under, which are interesting in and of themselves. And it's good to be able to capture those. Um, and what's interesting with those is that they all occur within basically within the space of 20 years. So you've all, so again, it gets into get linguistics then. Uh, you can add a description. So it includes a village of the same name. I wasn't too sure which came first, the village or the townland. You'd expect the townland, so we'd go with that. You then you have its location, so it's spatial location on a map. You have linked events. So we have two residence events in this case. Um, you have people, so from those two events, we can say that is telling that these two residents <clears throat> and then we also have linked organizations so we can say it's part of Kindress Parish, part of Dungan, Dungannon Barony and part of Tyrone County. That's generally what you'll see if you're looking at an organization. And another thing to point out is that all the text you see in blue you can select so that will bring you to that entity or whatever it is organization event person. So it's a way of navigating around the database quite quickly and easily. So once we have the database in place, it's down to sources. Um, these are just a selection of sources that, uh, just, that have been ingested. So the big one are the muster rolls. And for anyone who isn't familiar, basically the muster rolls are a military inspection. In this case, to do militia set up as part of the plantation. Um, there's about 170, I think, in total. So basically estates and the people who muster for those estates. Um, 
that was a big work. Our Bob Hunter spent a lot of time collating this work, working on it. And then following his death, as part of the Hunter Committee, John Johnson edited the, the remainder and published it. And it's a really excellent resource, I must say. Um, it's, <clears throat> as you can see, there's 13,300 people. In it, so just that alone is quite, um, it stands out basically. Uh, the next one then are land grants, patents. Uh, these cover 1610 to 1615, and these are taken mainly from George Hill's work on the Ulster Plantation. Um, there's about 400 in total, um, about 110 are undertakers for grants to undertakers. There's about 60 to servitors, and then the remainder are two native grantees, so the Gaelic Irish. Um, and that's not to say that because there's more native grantees, that doesn't mean they got more land. It was usually much smaller parcels that the, of land they were given. Um, there are other grants that came across after this, so they've been added where I found them. So it could be someone might purchase an estate from the original grantee, and then they'll actually get a patent regranted by the king or whoever later on. Uh, the next source is the Summon Ester Rolls. And again, this is from Bob Hunter's work. Um, very interesting source. Uh, in this instance, it's Tyrone. There's also a copy for Londonderry. Um, and basically, some of the roles are so synopsis or notes on court cases, court sittings. So you'll have usually have the court of assize or the court of quarter sessions. Um, to me, they're really it's a really fascinating source because it's naming people, people who don't turn up elsewhere usually. So there's probably three, four hundred people in the summarized roles who aren't in the muster roles, even though they're basically contemporaneous. Um, and it gives you all different, you know, you could have justice of the peace, high sheriffs, seneschals, agents, constables being named, and then just people who are either appearing as part of the jury or being fined or being convicted for something. And usually they'll give you their address as well. So that's what I find the best. You can actually map in all these addresses. So I think in the end there's 500 <coughs> addresses just for Tyrone. So and that's something I'll show you. When it comes to the mapping. Uh, the next source then was Percival Maxwell's Scottish Migration to Ulster. You can't really skip that source. It's it's so good. What I did was I took the biographies at the back. There's about 50 biographies of the main Scottish undertakers and servitors. Um, and I used that to flesh out a lot of not just information on those people, but the movement of land. Who's acquiring this land after them? Are they staying on? Who's getting it? How are they acquiring it? Uh, the next one then are letters of denization. So again, these basically, if you think of it, it's kind of naturalization, someone who's been made a subject of Ireland, and they're usually usually all Scots. Um, and I only did a sample, so the first kind of series of grants, which are usually to do with undertakers and servitors, or usually just undertakers. The later ones I didn't because thousands of people come to Ireland, hundreds of people get these grants. But the problem is they might give you their address or so it might be John Shaw of Agna somewhere and that's it. So you have to go and find where is Agna, whatever, within nine counties. So it's a very slow process. And to be honest, I just didn't have the time to complete it, but it will be something to complete in the future. Uh, the next ones then, you can probably see that there's a bit of a focus on Tyrone. And that was the decision we made kind of partway through you can't do all this in a year. So we kind of said we take a county. Tyrone is an interesting county. You know, it has a bit of everything. It has servitors, it has undertakers, it has native grantees. There's a bit of everything going on there. Towns, important towns. So we kind of focused in on those and just brought them up to a kind of a good level that we can say, well, this is the product you could get at a later time if we expanded it out to include all the main counties or even just the ESG counties. Um, Two surveys at Carew and Pinyar, um, two famous surveys. And they can grant, they can, you can link those surveys into the original grants. Right? So you can actually see the kind of progress of just even these estates, these grants, never mind the people who were involved. Um, and there are other surveys we could do in the future. There's uh, Bodley, 1622 Commission, um, and there's probably one more. Next source then is another Bob Hunter source. It's Straban Barony during the plantation. I haven't finished this one yet, but it's an excellent source of 
basically of names and people and where they are at certain times, what they're doing. And a lot of times <clears throat> you won't see this information elsewhere. So just for that, it's really useful. And again, it's fleshing out biographies. It's not just shoveling in names. It's trying to get something else into the trying to build on that. Um, final source there then is another Bob Hunter one. It's published on the RG Hunter um, collection website. Uh, it's part one, and that just gives you a really good overview of who's who within the planter or the settler population in the barony of Oma at that time. So basically John Davies, the Morvans, and a few others, and basically what goes on with the land there. So again, another interesting source, and it adds to basically the analysis of Tyrone. So <clears throat> we have the database, we have our sources. The next part then is basically taking those sources or that information that's analog, let's say, or just physical and translating it into digital. So the first one, the first page here is from the muster rows, the index. So what you do, or basically what I had to do there was photograph each page. Then using Photoshop or another editor, basically increase the contrast, make the text stand out more, and then you use what's called OCR to scan it. So that will actually scan the page, look for the text, and then transfer it over into this CSV file, which is basically an Excel or spreadsheet. So that will hopefully copy it across. Um, it's not perfect, none of these technologies are, so you have to look out for certain things. And if you see it once, you, you know it's happening. So once you identify it once, you can go and fix it elsewhere. So small little things might be the S on the end of James will disappear for some reason. I don't know why, but it does. Um, the abbreviation for cabin CV, it, for some reason, never reads that. Um, so all these little small things, and again, you also have to check it manually. It's no good just scanning it and saying it's, it's ready to go. You have to check it, make sure everything is as best you can. And then once that's done, you transfer it into a bigger spreadsheet, bigger CSV file. And you basically start putting in all the bits and pieces you need for the system to ingest it. So what you see here is now, this is an early version, I can tell, because Stuart is still spelled with a D. So for certain surnames, you modernize them a bit. So it, we went with S-T-E-W-A-R-T -E instead of the D. Um, but this version is then added as an alternative, so that will appear with the name. Um, same with the forename. If Christian name comes up in any strange way, you can add that as an alternative. Uh, you a question? Yeah. The data integrity, like when you're looking back, if I'm looking at the record going, it's well, you get whatever is changed, whatever is replaced is added with the entry. So it's there under the name. You'll see the updated version as the main label, and then below that, you'll see the alternate appellation. So steward with a D, things like that. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> Then also you see you have the undertaker. Well, actually, William Caulfield, he, is, he has two estates, one as an undertaker, one as a servitor. So once that's all done, this goes on for a lot further back to Excel. Um, we have a, a data ingestion tool, basically, that we built based on our work with Clericus. Whereas before, um, my colleague Stavros, I would give him the rules to follow to ingest this data. It could be 10 pages long and he could spend two weeks coding it. So it's not very time efficient. So through this experience, we ended up building custom tools. So what used to take two weeks can now take two hours and it's just me. I don't need anyone else to help. So it's much more efficient. And even that in and of itself is a very useful tool. And if anyone wants to have a look at it at the end, you're more than welcome. Uh, and what that does really is you tell the system what the data in each of these columns is. So you say, I want to create a person. So what you do is you say, well, column A is the database number if you has one. That's the surname, that's the alternative, that's the Christian name, and that's the alternative, and that's your person entity. So when you build all your entities across the data set, you then get your relations and say, well, Robert Smith, uh, mustard for Caulfield Estate. So you, you build it that way. Um, and that is that one. Oh, so once you have it, ready to go, you ingest all the data. So all these muster all data, this is basically what you get. 
this is the base, most basic kind of entry you'll get in the system. So you can see we're looking at it from the person's perspective, so David Wallet. Um, and we see that he participated in military muster as a militiaman. And then you can see all the other militia or other participants, usually militiamen. You have the muster master William Graham there. <clears throat> and you can also then see that has association with Henry Pierce. So he's the landlord, and you can't say for certain that he was actually there at the time this occurred. So you can say the rest of them are there. They had to muster, they had to appear. Um, so you say it has association with him. He's the landlord associated with this event, but we cannot say that he was physically there during this basically event. Um, then you also get connected organizations, so the Barony of Clankey, County of Cavan, and then the estate itself. You have your date, and then you have your location. Um, and then <clears throat> from that event, you can actually say the following. So this, this is kind of an abbreviated way of communicating, so it's a quick way for someone to look at an entry and say, oh, this is the person I'm looking for, or no, it's not. So you can see he must have for the Pierce estate, he must have for Clankey, Barney, and he was a resident of Cavan. Beyond that, you can't really say anything else. In the beginning, I thought, well, if they must have for the estate, they must be a tenant. But no, that's not really the case a lot of the time. Um, <clears throat> And then you have your source. So if you were to click on that source, it'll bring you to it. And there's actually a link to the index for it from the Hunter collection. So if you've any, if there's a bit of data and you're a bit suspicious about it, you can check it from another source and see is it correct or is there a mistake? Hopefully there's no mistakes, but you can never be 100% sure. So that's a source with one resource or an entry. This then is an entry with two resources. So in this case, we have an individual named Richard Fixer. So you can see the alternate stand on his name. So I have different ways it appears. He has the title of gentleman. <clears throat> and basically you have all sort of one, two, three, four, five additional events on top of his militia muster. <clears throat> um, from actually the court records, his, his wife appears in the courts as well. So. And she's a very unique name, Gert, Gert Roki. I don't know, it's the Dutch, German, um, no one seems to know. Um, but again, you're building up <clears throat> not just his connections to certain events, but his connections directly to people. So his family relations in this sense. And then from all those sources, we can say, or those events, we can say he was a Burgess of Ahar. Uh, he mustered for the Erskine Estate, he mustered for Clahar Barn, <clears throat> Barn. He was a resident of Tyrone and he was a resident of Ahar itself. So you can see one source, just a bit of information, two sources, it gets better. And then just finally to show you four sources, this is William Hamilton. Um, and another thing is all these individ individuals I'm showing you, none of them were undertakers or servitors, so they're, they're not that top there, it's people below that. And you can see from this, he has 43 events. So again, it does this kind of exponential growth. Um, so it starts with his birth, and the very last event is his death. So, but the, the last 30 years of his life isn't there because it goes past 1641, basically. And that's kind of the cutoff point. Um, and then you have his people relationships, his son, <laughs> his grandfather. Um, oh, and also, you see these ones here, probably the same person as, possibly the same person as. This is, you know, is when you're dealing with these types of sources, sometimes you just don't know, is this the same person? Um, and this is a way of kind of communicating it, but also trying to communicate certain levels of certainty about what you're saying. So probably the same person as is, that's me saying, I'm pretty sure this is the same person, but I cannot say it for certain. I cannot 100% say this is him. Possibly is, it's probably not him, but it's worth being aware of the existence of this person in your research, okay? And then everyone's like, was probably related to us. That's you know, they're living in, Robert Hamilton and him are living in the same place around the same time. Good chance they're related, even though there are a lot of Hamiltons in the area, but there's a good chance they are. Uh, I had to cut it this, I couldn't show everything on this page, but all his organizations are there, then the four sources down the bottom. So that's kind of how it grows. And then I will just show you a bit of the website. Come up. Yeah, so this is what we saw at the beginning. Oh, I have to. Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah. Ah, there we go. Lovely. Um, so yeah, this is the landing page. Um, there's a few images there from the National Library and elsewhere, just up on, on the carousel, um, and they're all linked, so you can go and have a look at them if you're interested. Uh, paintings. At the moment, it's 14,560. There was 14,561 this morning, and then I realised there was a double entry, so I'm going backwards um, <laughs> after all my work. Um, you'll see just basic numbers here. You know, there's 185 estates that we've identified. Not 185 proportions, that's a whole other thing. Um, 387 locations, so again, points on the map that we can say, well, this is where this occurred, or basically this is where it occurred. And uh, the wording here is we're supposed to change this. Uh, there aren't that, num that many unique last names. There's that many variations on surnames. So you could have Hamilton with two M's, Hamilton with two L's. So it's just that's all these put together. This is how many surnames you have, slight variations on them. Um, if you want to get into the database, you can just go to people here or organization. You want to look at organizations directly or events directly. So you can navigate which way you want to look at it, beginning with. But and or you can just select here, search database. So this is basically what you get. Um, you have your filters on the left, so you can go by event type. OK, so we're looking at addresses here are bold domiciles there's 460 okay so they're mainly tyrone ones um you have burials appointments judicial events so that's the courts basically honorific title is people's you know gentlemen baron lord uh, esquire whatever it is military inspection is the muster rolls uh naturalization are the papers of denization and there's all some there might be only one or two entries what is there possibly a couple of hundred to look at. Um, so let's say if you wanted to look at everyone who had an address in, it's going to be Tyrone, but you can look at it here. You say, okay, we're looking for Tyrone County. There's 411. And then you can narrow it down and say, well, I only want the people who appear in um, the summon ice rolls, which is going to be basically everyone in this case, but um, if we can find it. So again, it'll narrow it down for you. There's actually 56 or so there's more to actually got more Tyrone addresses from elsewhere and then you have gender now um when you talk about gender and balance when it comes to the early modern period you have to apologize because it's the sources really um as you know records on males just far away female result uh, records but just in what i was doing you could, there are <laughs> not three that's more than three <laughs> um not, not a lot more, but there are more, 53. OK, so they're really coming from you know, the waves of planter or the, of undertakers. Um, I did one actual deposition from 1641 deposition, so that's her there, Gertrude Carlyle. So she's actually one of the better ones. Um, you have a couple appearing in the courts. Um, but again, future phase of the project, the best way to address this, would, I think, will be the 1641 depositions. It's pretty, you know, it's a fantastic resource, despite what it depicts, I suppose to say. The amount of information it gives you about people's, their relationships, you know, where they lived, what kind of life they had, did they know their neighbours, did they get out with their neighbours, things like this. You know, it's not perfect, but it is a very good source. Um, and again, you can search by locations if you want, so, and then dates, you can refine it by dates. If you're a bit stuck and you're wondering where what, what's going on here, you can click these fellas here, filters, so it'll describe to you what you're seeing and it'll explain it out. Um, the same with if you go to events, you get the same thing. You can enter an event. Uh, so this is a, an actual description of someone. So someone was described as an inferior Borges. Um, and these are all the individuals who had that title. Um, so if you're a bit uncertain about what you're looking at, you can kind of go here and it'll give you, well, this is what the people side of things is about. Um, there's one for events, but it doesn't come up when you're in an event. Um, oh, sorry, here's the event one. So this is a more detailed one. It's basically what I was just previously telling you, but in a more condensed version to explain basically what you're seeing on screen and how it's trying to explain the information that's being presented. 
or how it's depicting information. Um, then finally, I will just show you a bit on the visualizations. So there's two visualization features. One is spatial distribution. Uh, this is probably for the majority of people, this is the most interesting one or the easiest one to navigate around. So you can see the first one are the military inspections. So these have all been mapped to at least their barony. In a lot of cases, I just haven't had time to go and find, well, where exactly is this estate in this barony? There are a few, so I think the Sanderson estate, yeah, I've been able to locate. Uh, you can go into it, any of the events. So this is the Erskine estate, so this is around Ahar in, is it Ahar or Ahar? Ahar, <laughs> I'm still saying it wrong. But, um, so I'll give you a little description sometimes, the date, the location, then all the people involved, and you can navigate to their entries if you want through that um, you have organizations so again it's like what you're seeing but this time it's been or from the person perspective but here it is just being mapped um, and it just gives you a different perspective on the data and a different way to approach it um, and as you can see there's about 117 military inspections then we have the plantation grants um, kind of technically you should have that to force them but I don't think people mind too much um, so here you have grants uh, let me see an interesting one. So what I did with the grants is where did it give the description of the estate? If it's a nice condensed description, that goes in fully. If it's one for a servitor where it goes on for two pages, naming out really random places, I condense it down to what department information and I give you the names of the first few uh, denominations of land. So let's see, we'll have a look here again. So this is so you can see that's the basic description of the grant, um, the date. So I think this is Chichester or Ridgeway, so Thomas Ridgeway. Uh, so he's the undertaker. You have what he's been granted. So you have the name of the proportion. So it's a great proportion. So that's 2000 acres. You have the manor that's being granted with it. And then the barony that is taking place within. And also because we have um, the two surveys, the Carew and Pinyar surveys for Tyrone, they are also linked into the grant then as well. So you can actually follow what does Carew have to say about the plantation on this estate a year after, and then you have Pinyar following up seven or eight years later. So it gives you a nice kind of description of the progress of the plantation on certain estates, on certain towns, things like that. Um, so again, oh, another one are the London companies, the livery companies. Now I couldn't find in the time I had the actual dates they were granted. I know they were grant they took possession at least very quickly after they had a lottery, I believe. Um, but the only grants I could find were in Moody's work on the companies and they are dated. I'm gonna tell you around 16, 18, 17, 18. So I'm not sure is it a the the actual force grant or is it a regrant for some reason? You you do get regrants, so it's something I'll have to look into. Um, but I did connect each one to the lottery, so you can go back and see what date the lottery took place and who are all the different livery companies are for London Dairy. Um, and again, they are a whole other project in and of their own, as you can imagine. Next one then is uh, abodes and domiciles. This is the one I find the most interesting. Um, just off, I was thinking about it today, just off the top of your head, if you were to look at every address and the people and people who are living there, you know, are they Scottish, English, Irish, Welsh? And to be able to map that, then you get a better, possibly a better idea of the distribution of where these different groups are living. Are they all intermingled? Are they spread out? You know, what does the terrain have to do with it, the geography? Um, but this is Tyrone and you can already see a bit of a pattern there. It's it's following the main roads as we know them today um, and it's clustered around certain settlements. Um, one of the interesting ones I found was this one here, Island McHugh. Um, when I read up on it, it's, how do they explain it? It's the longest recorded continuous settlement they know of in Western Europe. So here we have an example of someone continuing on that trend and still living there into the 1600s. Uh, in this case, it's Alexander Tyndall. Um, and you have basically the name of the townland. You can see you can work away on those. Um, there are a few outside of the county and they actually come from court records. It's people being convicted in Tyrone but or being looked for in Tyrone and they have addresses outside of um, the county. Um, but again, if you're to 
do the same here as the Lon for the London area example. You'd be covering all this area, and then over time, again, it's layering in information, layering, layering, layering. It's really boring, but the product is, I think, worth it in the end. Um, so again, if you're interested, you can go. You, I find when you're using this, you end up spending a lot more time than you intended because you just end up clicking and you're following so many different relationships and things like that. Uh, and then the last one is tendencies. Now the tendencies, they're not, no, they're not great. It's Tyrone again, um, and it's by Barony mainly. So you can see they're very much clustered together. Um, and I got these from the footnotes in the muster rolls. So a mix of uh, Bob Hunter and John Johnson's work. Um, and John Johnson, I believe, was the one who took information from the 1641 depositions and the 1622 commission and put them in. Um, so they're really interesting to hear, you know, who's renting what from who, who's subtenants, cottagers, freeholders, things like that. Um, and again, it's another thing just to expand be there, and it is, but um, it's a job for another day to expand. And just sorry, I meant to mention about the plantation grants. That when you're looking at the plantation grants, where you see large numbers, that's a sure giveaway. That is that's where the native grants are being made. OK, so where you have a native grant, you usually have servitors alongside them, a couple of servitors. So you can see Dungannon. Um, I'll pretend like I know where every, every place is. This is from Mana, I believe. Yep, Glen Ali. So you can see this, this is a servitor proportion, native proportion, native proportion. So again, um, depends what you're interested in. And I suppose one of the things I found and going back to the title of the talk was it's you know, the Ulster Settlers um, database, new resource for the study of the province and its people. And I said that on purpose. Um, it's because if you study the settler population, you will end up studying the Gaelic Irish. And if you were to study the Gaelic Irish in Ulster at this time, you would invariably end up studying the settler population because they're so intertwined and the sources we have for one group, say to set, so any information really we have on the native Irish at this time is coming from the settlers. So it's, you can't not include them, I suppose is the thing to say. So out of 14,560 sources, about 400 I'd say were Gaelic Irish. Um, and then the remainder are Scots, uh, English, Welsh. Um, there's one Frenchman as well, there's always one. Um, <laughs> So he's, he's around, he's living in Coleraine at this time. He's a merchant, James Usher, I think his name was. And I think he, he probably would have been a, a Huguenot as well. So he's an interesting character that would probably warrant a bit more research sometime. Um, so just briefly then going back to this slideshow. This is the last slide, Peter. Um, so kind of what was, oh, sorry, no. no. Just to finish off, what might be done in future phases of the project? So again, as I was saying, you can't do it all in a year, um, and these things do need a lot of planning. You just don't pick a source and say that's going into the database. You have to say, well, what's the reason for putting it in? How will it make it better? How will it connect with other sources? Um, and that's really what you look for, trying to interconnect things on all levels. Um, sorry, that's the wrong sources. Yeah, there we go. So for future phase, really all I did was Sources that stand out, um, complete the crew, Pinyar, 1622 surveys for all of Ulster will be one um, work package, I suppose. The Ulster port books, which I had in initially because they're fantastic um, and they're, I think they're unique for all of Ireland for this period. I don't think there's any other port books for Ireland. You will find them in, in England, all right, but I don't think there's any others apart from these. So they're, they're really, really valuable. Um, essentially, if you don't know what a port book is, it records ships coming into port and the taxes that are being paid on the goods that are on board and the other way around. If they're leaving the port, what customs are they paying? It's only the only record what they pay customs on. And at this, at this time, there's a massive amount of smuggling going on as well. So it's not a perfect picture, but it's a very good picture of the trade and the connection between Ulster and Europe. And that will be a good thing to be able to expand it out a bit further, just beyond Ireland and look at what are the connections with Europe, possibly North America at some stage. Uh, as I mentioned before, the 1641 depositions, if I had to pick one, I think it would be those, but the only thing is there's so many of them, so you'd have to break it up and it'd be, it is a big project, but I think it will be quite interesting to see what the results will be on that. 
you mentioned these before to someone else, they're also London Dairy, and I think there's possibly one for Cabin, not a complete version. I've seen it mentioned and then mentioned elsewhere it doesn't exist, and then someone's saying it doesn't exist, so I'm not too sure if it does or not. So it'll be interesting to see what they were doing in Cabin at that time. There's a great parchment book basically to do with the London Dairy companies. That's been digitized. It's if you search it online, the Great Parchment Book, it's one of the first things that comes up. It's a really good resource. It's a little database. They have all the people mentioned, all the places. So it's similar enough to this. So again, and in future, it could be possible rather than start from scratch, basically to share data with each other. They transfer over their data. They might like something we have. So it would be a good collaboration, possibly. Uh, Inquisitions. They pop up all over the place. They're good for figuring out changes in ownership, who people are and all other interesting bits and pieces of information. And then the final one, last but not least, will be the plantation maps. So many of you are probably aware that the collection of maps is quite remarkable for us, or I would say for the plantation. And what you would do there is taking these maps, scanning them, and then overlaying them over that modern map I have. OK, so you're getting, you know, two sources in one. You're seeing how people at the time would have seen these areas, how they're connected, how they're broken up, um, how they're divided. And it'd be just a good resource. Um, and again, you could expand that. You could do the down survey maps from later on. Now, the down survey maps for the North aren't as um, informational, I suppose, as others, but again, it will be a, a step to take. Um, and that's basically it, everyone. And thanks very much for your time. And thank you. Richard, that's great. Thank you so much. I mean, this is obviously an extremely important and useful new resource. And thank you for explaining its architecture as well as its content. Very important uh, that we understand that. Uh, we've got time for some questions, both from people in the room and, and online. Uh, so obviously people in the room know what to do. People online, if you press the uh, the reactions button and then the little hand icon, that will just indicate that you want to ask a question. So who'd like to start? Anyone? Yes, please. Um, wondering is there any information how people kind of got on with each other? In other words, if you're English and you ended up somewhere, you know, there's people where you kind of put the kind of antipathy, was there kind of a bit of hatred towards them? Because I think there was kind of supposedly, I don't know how true this is, but the Scottish people that came over were from different clans and were fighting in Scotland and when they came here. The Grahams. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they brought it with them, this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The court records, well, the only way I can answer that from my own experiences from the court records, uh, the summon rights roles. And the problem with the summon rights roles is they'll either tell you exactly what's going on in the court case or they won't tell you anything. They'll just give you a list of names and you're kind of left is why is this person here? They're just a name party. Um, it, I haven't seen too much of it myself. Um, what I've read about, you know, I, I suppose I've, I've seen it in other sources, references to disputes. Um, particularly over lands, one I'd know best would be one person is granted one piece of land, another person comes along and has their overlap, overlapping claims, and that's where you see a lot of friction. Um, honestly, I don't know, I haven't seen too much yet, but it is something again to to be able to chart if we do come across it. What, how are you know exactly are these people interacting with each other? You know, a map is is great. You see them all beside each other, but as you say, what is actually the relationships and what's going on there? Um, so I suppose the short answer is I don't know sure. too much, but it is a good. So you think the clans were fighting with each other when they came to Ulster? Possibly they were. They could have been. You know, they don't usually drop these things overnight. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> the one name that always pops in is the Grahams. They're the, the kind of famous ones, um, and I think a lot of people, Scots on the border counties, ended up in Fermanagh. They think because. They were in so much trouble back in Scotland that it was a good place to hide and a lot of the smuggling going on and stuff. So it was their little hiding place. Um, but beyond that, I'm not too sure at the moment. But yeah, and you take you'd, you'd steal a few horses and cows while they're gone and you bring them with you. And <laughs> <laughs> that's how you stock all stuff, basically. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of a lot of um, smuggling going on as, as it was ever else. It was, you know, it's a thing you can't really police too well. But. Um, it was important in this case. Um, I'm sure there probably is. Um, 
there's so many databases now, um, not just even prospect graphical ones. I'll do, do, do. Maybe someone here or someone online will answer that. Did know more about the Huguenots, but I, I would imagine there is. But if there isn't, there's certainly enough information out there to do something like this. Um, and again, it's something like this. You know, if the Huguenots are in Ireland around this time, is that a population we add in with this population? Make it the whole island, or do we just focus in on Ulster? It depends. You know, it's really what's the best move, I suppose. What what's you know the best bang for your buck, I suppose. So no problem. Right. Um, so, obviously, one of the key things is establishing relationships between people. So, do you have to do that in, in a scholar, traditional scholarly fashion, or is there anything within the system no. that actually helps you to no. communicate? No. It's all done. Nice. Every decision is a man made decision or made by a person, yeah, which is me. <laughs> so, <laughs> resources and your kind of like yeah. resources. Who is himself? It's 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 an enjoyable practice in one sense, but it's also mind-numbingly. And the more you do that, then that increases. Exactly. And usually, it's not even you can narrow it down sometimes to one person, and you can be almost sure this is them. It's just you're missing that direct thing. Other times, you could have seven possible possibilities. You know, if someone was called John Bell or someone or Walter Bell or William Bell, you say, well, there's a like just 10 William Bells in the surrounding counties. So it could be that person who could be just in Tyrone for a short period, they might have moved, so you don't really know. Um, but yeah, and you, you do pick up, you know, from certain works like um, George Hill's work and Percival Maxwell's, you know, they are telling you the relationships as well. But oftentimes you might find mistakes. So or one person might say, this is the person's wife or this is the person's wife. And sometimes it turns out that they marry twice, but there's no rec exact record of it. But you do see it in elsewhere in the records with grants and things like that, or um, jointures, things like that. You see, there's a reason why there's a lack of clarity, I suppose, but you can figure it out. But it does take time, a lot of time. Um, but it's enjoyable once you figure it out. It's like anything, it's a puzzle, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, some recollection of uh, that's true. I did meet Bob Hunter a few times, and he had the most wonderful vituperative tongue in relation to his colleagues within the history of the <laughs> So I don't know whether that was reflecting, but he yeah. was wonderfully entertaining. Yeah. I get that impression, I do. He's from people I've spoken to. He's well, very well liked and respected as a person and as a historian, yes. So his spirit continues to preside. Definitely. <laughs> Meal. Oh, thank you. Limits in the context of the years work. Mm. Uh, but in in that regard, uh, and you mentioned yourself sharing data. Uh, to what extent have you been able to use uh, other sources, online sources that are already in existence, databases on places in particular? I have a specific interest in the Northern Ireland system mm -hmm. as as Greg would have had to in the past, um, and we have the Lloyd Evans site as well. Yep. So. So how are those resources utilised and what is the capacity for linking your data with their data? Um, as to, well, as I said, Logan and then Townlands that are yeah, probably the two go to. There's another one, I can't think of the name. It's I think it's a private one, but it's again along those lines. Pretty <laughs> so, um, again, when it comes to these things, I'm doing it manually. You kind of have to um, because you're trying to, you know, the name of, as you know yourself, the name of a place 400 years ago can often do somersaults and end up being something a bit different. Um, so it's trying to figure that out. That again, it's like trying to figure out the relationship between people. You're trying to figure out, is this the exact place they're talking about or is it somewhere different? Um, I'm, when it comes to actually kind of batch or mass sharing data, um, you could, It's it comes down to mapping and sharing coordinates, I suppose is the thing. So you'd, as you know, in these databases or in townlands or Ghanaian, they have geolocation. This is the extent of this organization, as I call it, or townland, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and you could do it that way. You, I suppose, kind of map it over onto your map. Um, now, again, I'm nowhere near an expert on this. The best person for this is um, Stavros, who's our technical officer. He, he could kind of tell you in two seconds how you do it. Um, 
but it is possible and all these things are possible if, if it's digitized you can do something with it at least um but again i'm not an expert on that translation over um it's not something i've done too much of but it is again something we would look to do in the future it's you get to a stage we're going to say well how can we share what we have and how can we benefit from that interaction as well it's and it saves everyone a lot of work yeah that'll be another thing to yeah another, yeah definitely yeah, just uh, do want to all the questions, but uh, I think what you really need then is you need the resource indicators uh, uh, so that, uh, you know, a person mm -hmm. has a code associated with them rather than just a, a name which could be the same as somebody else's name. Yeah. yeah, that's what we actually do that. So every every entity in the system has its a number, basically. Yeah. So the first entry into it would be in 0001 right. and it goes up and up. So every townland every location has a distinct identifier because you need that when you're batch transferring information um, from say a spreadsheet into the database and so if you're saying like this military muster took part on this estate that estate has to be constant for everyone in that list for them all to transfer into that one event so it's the it's actually the number that it's not even the name is important when it gets down to this level. It's the number that they're copying over onto. Um, so replace it then. What you want is your uh, unique number to match me also. Exactly. Number. Yep. Uh, there's two different systems. They need to communicate basically. Yep. Yeah. Um, but there are ways of doing it now. Again, I I know less than most people. I would say even about that topic. But there are. I've been told. You know. Again, my colleague Stavros would. Tell you very quickly how you go about between the different formatting and all this kind of stuff so um but again yeah it is i think all these projects are kind of going that way sharing data you have to you know um but hopefully yeah no that's something to do for the future it's another big project okay um if anyone's online and wants to ask a question or ask a question um i do see a hand up perhaps do you do you want to ask a question or is that just um Glitch. Oh, you're done with some there. Okay. Uh, yeah, back me. Well, yeah. well, Pat, just thinking. Um, so, a somewhat related question in terms of the technology. So, I'm in the Masters in Public History program here, and so we've talked a lot about digital history projects, and and one of the things that we've discussed is is sort of how do you think about the maintenance. Of them. So at the end, you you know, you've talked about sort of expanding it and ideas with sharing data, looking at new sources, but even just keeping it going. Walk away yeah, yeah. and the the you know it won't the just fellowship ends, the funding ends. How how does this sort of continue on when sometimes underlying software changes or you know you were using third party systems and, and yep. those stop being supported? So I'm curious what um Kind of how much thought has gone into that and, and what um, strategies are kind of. Yeah, no, it's a very good, very, very good question. Very pertinent question because you look at a lot of these databases, they're done and then what happens? To them? You know, they might keep going. They need they need maintenance space, as you said. What we've done, what we've decided to do is, as you can see down here, we have clericus in the URL. So it's www.ulster. settlers.clericus.ie. So basically this database is piggybacking off that um, name server okay so they're both on the same server but they're separate so we know for certain that the clericus database will be maintained for the next number of years we know that much so as long as we maintain that we maintain this so it's a way of kind of because as you said once this is finished in a month or so people just walk away and it's you know never seen again but yeah that's basically our, our way of addressing that keep them all in one place would depend on menos. I think that's that's <laughs> all part of the grand strategy. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, any other questions? Yes, yeah. I'm um, like everybody else, I'm kind of at all. <laughs> you're, what you're telling me is really really good. But uh, I mean, the, I suppose that you know, having compiled all of this and having it all together, 
resource plan, as soon as we've made them speak to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, has this produced any possibilities for future research? Has it produced you know, ways forward that we can see that we're following up? Um, it's kind of. When you're doing these projects, you kind of say the next resource, I'll definitely see something. And as oh no, the next resource, I'll definitely see something. You're kind of waiting for the something to jump out to you. And sometimes it doesn't. And in the end, I think it comes down to just you keep adding in relevant sources, you keep layering the information, and then eventually you will come, you'll either spot it yourself or you can go to the data visualization feature and you can talk to it that way. And you'll see that will pick up connections and things, you know, going back two, three, four, five steps from each other. Um, but as it stands, I haven't come across anything spectacular myself uh, yet. Um, but as I said, it's kind of you're waiting for it to. And again, Ulster plantation isn't my so special, my, my area or my period to specialize in. Um, this timeline, yes, but so I'm not the best qualified, I suppose, to look at the information and say, well, this is, we can definitely get something out of this. It's people who are working on this type of material day in, day out, who will see things um, that I won't see, basically. And I'll admit when I don't know something, so that's <laughs> it. Was what I'm aware of thinking about, about it, Richard, is that you know, a big um, digital humanities project like, like this is about democratization of sources. Mm -hmm. It's about making the resources available, available. to people out there in, in the communities mm -hmm. who are interested in their own their, their local history who may not have had the, the kind of access to the, the, the kind of interconnectedness mm -hmm. and the availability of these sources before and, and so now from that background yeah. of configuring and visualization in a certain way mm -hmm. that, that we might have not be thinking of exactly yep so, yeah no, I, I do too. and to be honest if i had something like this my own home area back home you'd be like oh my gosh like this is really useful um, and hopefully people will find it useful, I suppose, in whatever, in whatever context they use it. Um, and this has been true of the 1641 deposition science in particular. So mm -hmm. this is, I mean, that's been in existence now for a few years and available to the public. Yeah, it's got, that's yeah. as long as I can remember it's there, you know, and it's still plugging along. Um, and again, another fantastic resource. Um, and it, it helps all these projects, not just for their visibility, but just for their continued existence that if you can another project can kind of grab hold of and say you are really important, you're really useful and it kind of brings them back into focus again for people. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, some sources you have, it is impossible. The kind of uh, market you have for individuals don't include religion. Uh, is that right? So you know, yeah, the sure. numbers of Catholic families. Mm -hmm. Uh, so is there some way of capturing that kind of thing? It's a tough one. So if you're saying Scottish Catholics, you're probably looking at the, is it the Hamptons around Strabane. Yeah. Um, it's a tough, it's a very tough one. Um, you could say, well, the Native Irish, why well, not are they going to be Catholic? Scots could be, it depends, I suppose, maybe where in Scotland they're from, what area. So maybe to understand that, you're better off looking at the name first. And trying to localize it, which will be, I think, will be another interesting thing is to take the muster rolls and work back and see, you know, Armstrong is primarily the borders. So you can say, well, this person probably originated from there. And you can kind of come at it from that direction. And what what was the state of religion in that area at that time, maybe? Um, but it is, yeah, it was something I had on my mind. Do you add a connection to a church or a religion? But the problem is, I'm guessing a lot of the time, so I can't really. But it is, it is a very useful, it will be something, again, like all these things to do, even to attempt, how do you go about even trying to fit, suggest what someone's religion is, using the evidence available. That there are no parochial records going back this far. I'm sure there must be some, um, and maybe not this far. First session books, uh, 1640s. Yeah. 1640 kind of is the breaking point, yeah, after 1640, things go up, whereas before that you're kind of looking around from really your searching as best you can. But no, it's a very good question. How do you, yeah, that's, with the last project I was on, it was pretty straightforward. They're all priests, so I could, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you'd like to say Yeah, you'd hope that's the. Yeah. <laughs>
Great. Okay. Look, thanks very much, everyone. I think uh, Richard's given you a real sense of, of the potential of this project. Um, it is phase one, but it is available, you know, so uh, do go on and have a look at the, at the site uh, online. You'd be happy to receive any feedback. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. r.fitzpatrick.qub.ac.uk if people want to, um, uh, to e e email Richard their, their thoughts on it, suggestions for further development. Uh, hopefully there will be further tranches of money coming forward um, to allow the, the further development that uh, Richard just talked about. Um, got a fingers crossed on that. That's it, yeah. Away. And <laughs> toes, fingers and toes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you all for, for coming and participating. Um, we perhaps just finished by giving Richard a round of applause. <laughs>